On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled, How to Improve Patient Safety Throughout the Coordination of Care for the Surgical Patient. My name is Kelly Gibson, and I will be your moderator for this program. Now I would like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Penny Hoover is a nurse paralegal and continue, continue service readiness CSR nurse consultant for Joint Commission Resources. She has served as Director of Patient Safety and Regulatory Excellence in Hospitals, where she was involved in accreditation and certification for hospital and disease-specific care programs. Ms. Hoover exhibits advanced knowledge and skills in patient safety practices, continuous process improvements, regulatory readiness, patient satisfaction, healthcare operations, and risk management principles. She also has experience in policy and procedure development, quality, patient safety, education, employee health, workers' compensation, disease management, enhanced primary care case management, and compliance. Penny, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Kelly, for that great introduction. And welcome, everyone. I would like to take time, um, as Kelly said, the presentation today is how to improve patient safety through the coordination care of the surgical patient. I would like to take a moment, as always, for uh, every presentation that you would have. Certainly, we do have the objectives here in front of you. I won't read them to you. And this will guide our presentation as we go throughout uh, this next hour. I would like to take a time to do a pre-knowledge check. And the reason why we're doing the pre-knowledge check is just so that we can see, take a temperature of where we are now compared to where we, uh, our uh, knowledge is post-survey. So before we begin, we would like to do, answer the next three uh, polling questions. The first question is, does using an evidence-based communication tool help improve the care coordination of surgical patients? The second polling question is, do you use an evidence-based communication tool during the coordination of care for surgical patients? And lastly, do you know how to identify and mitigate the risks of safety events in the surgical arena? While we're answering those questions, I would like to take a moment to thank uh, to thank Regina Hoffman, the Executive Director of the Patient Safety Authority, for being my mentor throughout my practicum project. This presentation is brought to you today because of the practicum project. I am an MSN student at Chamberlain College of Nursing, and this is part of my practicum project and my uh, working through my, obviously, my project. It has been a pleasure working with her and the Patient Authority's team. They have been more than helpful throughout my journey. As you can see the polling questions here, it does look like that a lot of people do use the evidence-based communication tool to improve care during the surgical uh, patient. And it does look like most of us do use a, a communication tool during the coordination of care. And it does look like we do know how to identify and mitigate for the majority of us, it's actually half and half for number three, that's very interesting that we have some of us say, yes, we do know how to identify and mitigate the risks of safety events in surgical care, and some of us are not sure. So throughout this presentation, we will increase that knowledge base, and well, before we are completed, we will be able to identify and how we can mitigate those risks. The so coordination of care in a surgical patient as an MSN project, why this subject? I would like to pause here to tell you a personal story that impacted one of my loved ones. During a surgical procedure, my husband had to have uh, pre-admission testing. He went through to uh, the physician, he went to, then he was uh, sent over to a uh, specialist, and I do travel extensively for my work. So I would leave on a Monday and I'm not back until Thursday or Friday. As a healthcare professional, you can see that this could make families very stressful. He's not very familiar with uh, medical jargon. So during the pre-procedure visit to the surgeon's office and pre-op testing appointments, my loved one told me many members he encountered about his medical condition. Each night I called home and my loved one explained to me that uh, he expressed to them his medical condition. 
He also said he had wrote this condition on an actual piece of paper on intake forms in the surgeon's office. The day of surgery, in the pre-op room, my husband was already prepped. The anesthesiologist and the surgeon came into the room and they were a little upset with my husband because they, they were not aware of one of my husband's conditions. And even though my husband documented it in the electronic medical record and on the paper, paper record, it was brought up promptly that my husband explained to them that he had von willing Brown's disease. And if you're not familiar with this disease, this disease prevents my husband from clotting and he really could have bled out. The unfortunate part was, even though to his dismay, he tried to stress in the pre-op area that he had this disease, he was told that this disease was common and that it's not to be worried about. So the surgeon's office was not communicating with the pre-op area. The pre-op admission testing office did not communicate to the surgeon, and the surgeon's nurse did not communicate to the surgeon or the anesthesiologist. Everyone we spoke to said that this was because of the electronic medical record. They were going to another electronic medical record and for some reason his past medical history did not cross over to the new electronic medical record. Even though despite my husband's effort of disagreeing with this is not a common condition and disagreeing with he actually even wrote it on a paper chart. So that had nothing to do with the electronic medical record. So promptly the surgery was canceled, and after the surgery was canceled, we had to follow back up with our primary care physician and with a hematologist to order clotting agents such as DDAVP like he had prior to any of his other surgeries. Even though he had confirmed a diagnosis years ago, he still had to endure more tests and time off of work and additional uh, scheduling of another surgery, which led to more time off work for the final surgery. This is a perfect example of breakdown in the coordination of care with a surgical patient, not to mention the added cost to the healthcare system and added cost to my loved ones because of additional time off work and patient dissatisfaction. This doesn't even explain the trust that was lost in my loved one's experience uh, throughout this whole process. So the practical project is my personal driving force because of my loved one. And how did I wind up with the Patient Safety Authority? I was looking to see who in the state of Pennsylvania could help make an impact or help educate uh, staff, such as uh, everyone on the call today, to identify a need to improve the coordination of the surgical patient. Working with the Patient Safety Authority, it was identified that there was not a formal review of events that happened during the coordination of care, not to mention specifically looking at the surgical patient. While the events are reviewed, the coordination of care really is a hard one to review, so we really centered in on that one uh, to really bring about the, uh, the reviewing of the data and, and, and the analysis. Although my practicum project is only 16 weeks and the authority is my practicum project site, I only have 16 weeks from the beginning to end to review data and my time is limited on the constraints. So unfortunately, we will not be able to see the actual results that uh, happen that would come from this presentation today. After reviewing and anal analyzing the data, uh, we did find, as I said, and we'll talk about the data a little bit later on here in, in the presentation, that uh, the main cause of uh, the issues of safety is because of handoff communication between healthcare work workers and departments was one of the main causes of those safety events and the data did display that. After reviewing the data and identifying a need to research this subject further, as advanced healthcare professionals, we know uh, to start any research project, we need to have a well-developed PICTO question to help guide you through your research. The PICTO question, and PICTO stands for the population, so what population am I targeting through my project? Well, that's everyone on the call here, our patient safety officers, uh, physicians, CNOs, um, any healthcare provider that is in within the state of Pennsylvania uh, that is listening to this presentation. And then is the intervention. We'll discuss my interventions on my next slide, and C stands for control, and then O stands for outcome, and C stands for time. So my, what is my PICTO question? As I explained before, population is the healthcare workers in the state of Pennsylvania. The intervention is education and 
a build a toolkit for evidence-based communication tools, which will be provided to you. The control is to review the baseline reported patient safety events in Pennsylvania related to care coordination with surgical patients. The outcome is to demonstrate an increase in knowledge on why and how to use evidence-based communication tools, pre and post education survey. That's one of the reasons why we had to take a polling question prior to starting the presentation. And the time is over a five-week period. And we say a five-week period because like we had said, uh, the, my constraints in my total practicum time is 16 weeks. We have time to develop the presentation and do all of the research with the PICTO question, and then time for the closing of the uh, presentation with survey and uh, post-survey results for the education. As healthcare professionals, we've been struggling with coordinating of care of our patients for years, and this is not new knowledge. Everyone on the call understands that. The overview of the care coordination, we know AHRQ says coordination, care coordination is deliberately organizing patient care by sharing patient information among the healthcare providers, family, and patient that is involved in the patient's care. The American Nurses Association explains how the nurse's role in the coordination of patient care is critical in helping to deliver safe, quality patient care to help decrease costs in the healthcare industry. What is the cost of poor care coordination? The lack of coordination of care can lead to decreased quality of care and increased safety events. According to Swan, Haas, and Jesse, there is an estimated $25 to $45 billion spent on unnecessary hospitalizations and complications that could have been avoided if there was coordination of care of the patient. The lack of coordination of care leads to increased hospital readmissions, duplication of tests that we've seen uh, with my husband and his, my loved one of his personal experience, and uh, increased office visits, increased costs, decreased, decreased quality of life, and in some cases, mortality. I would hate to think what would happen of my loved one if we were to proceed with the surgery and the pertinent people in his case did not know his past medical history. The lack of care coordination also leads to decreased patient satisfaction and poor outcomes and decreased quality of life. So we know that handoff communication between healthcare providers is the main reason of lack of care coordination. I explained that earlier, that, it, that, that the data demonstrated that. The Joint Commission conducted an evidence-based project that demonstrated 37% of handoff communication was unsuccessful, resulting in the lack of uh, pertinent knowledge of the patient that was not communicated to the next nurse or the next healthcare provider caring for the patient and recommends the use of a communi handoff communication tool. AR ARN explains that the almost 1,750 deaths over five years occur because of communication issues between healthcare workers. This is a picture of an ideal handoff communication. We all know that this is not the reality of what we see. Ideally, we would like to see the involvement of the patient, the patient support system, all the healthcare workers involved, and the patient's entire healthcare system. This includes not only when the patient is in the hospital, but also pre and post hospitalization. We know that this is what we ideally would like, but ideally this is not a reality, especially when it comes to the surgical patient. As we know, the surgical patient most of the time is not able to be involved in this handoff communication because either they're still under anesthesia or they're groggy. So the involvement of the patient really is, does not happen at that time. And it's very hard to get the surgeon in the handoff communication also they're off doing the next case or they are um, uh, ideally and rightfully so are very busy. So what we really need to want to take a look at is the nurse to next healthcare provider handoff communication. You ask why the surgical patient? Why not all patients? Well, mostly due to my own personal experience to have a focus on, on and also to have a focus on the data we pulled. You could imagine the vast amount of data if we just did care coordination for all of the patients. Um, we did narrow it down. Thinking about that PICTO question, we needed to narrow it down to the population, and then we needed to narrow it down to our outcomes. And the data was very clear that surgical patients was affected by poor communication. 
Adding to the complexity of the surgical department, there are many different types of handoffs that happen with each encounter, additionally in the surgical area and internal staff. The surgical staff needs to communicate to all, all units and all areas within the hospital. Aaron explains teaching hospitals have approximately 4,000 handoff communications daily. And it's estimated millions of patients come through the surgical department every year. And each surgical patient encounters, as we said, many different types of handoffs. And the internal surgical team hands off to many and multiple different types of departments. And many of them may use different types of communication tools. For communication results, communication errors results in 50%, 56% of operative and post-operative complications. 63% of retained foreign bodies are caused by a lack of communication. And wrong site or wrong procedure makes up 68% of safety events in the operating room, which are caused in part by inadequate handoff communication. So what's the big deal? The big deal is in most healthcare organizations, each department uses their own handoff communication tool. There's no standardized process. If there is a standardized process or the tool, if there is a standardized process, the tool is not used to its maximum, maximum potential or appropriately or at all. Communication errors are among the top three root causes of sentinel events every year since 2004. The evidence is in the data. So the driving force, what is the driving force? Well, let's take a look at the data. According to the Patient Safety Authority's reporting system, the majority of the event types were errors related to procedure treatment tests and other miscellaneous issues. When analyzing the data and breaking it down further by sub-event, we can find out exactly what happened here. So looking at this slide, you will see that this is just an event type. When you go into report events, you will see an event type, so you need to categorize it into an event type. What we did, uh, what I did partnering with the Patient Safety Authority and their data analysis and Regina, we broke it down further, looking at those sub-event types for all these categories that were reported, and we will find that they, it was indicated that there was no communication to the next healthcare provider, or there was miscommunication of post-procedure reports was not given, or handoff was incomplete to the next caregiver or handoff was clear, unclear, or just never even happened. So again, let's look at the data. As you can see, this slide demonstrates that in the, once we break down the data and analyze it further, in the sub-event type, it confirmed that handoff communication between caregivers was the root cause of patient safety events during the coordination of care of the surgical patient. And this really does, the evidence in the literature backs it up. While there were other communication safety events, as we can see here on this slide, handoff from one caregiver to the other was the majority of the sub-event type. Over 50% of the communication errors was because of the handoff communication. We already reviewed some examples, my driving force for my project, my MSN project. But when we looked at de the, some of the de-identified reporting patient safety events, we looked um, to some examples to help explain what happened. What were the details? What, what happened? What was the circumstances behind why that handoff communication did not happen? And here are a few, again, de-identified examples. So when, when a circulating nurse was being relieved in the operating room, during handoff report, it was not communicated that the patient was on droplet precaution. The operating room did not have any kind of indication on the doorway or on the ex exterior doorways that the patient needed droplet precaution. When the case ended and the patient was still in the operating room, the scrub nurse and other staff removed their masks still not knowing the patient was on droplet, communication, droplet precautions because that was not communicated to them. They also moved the patient to their bed without masks or gowns. As you can see, now we have some exposures of not only of the scrub nurse and anyone else who was in that operating room, but anyone else who is, is uh, 
with that patient during this time. The second example is the patient was administered general anesthetic, and then they had noticed that the patient had a piercing. There was no communication or there was no jewelry waiver that the patient had on body jewelry. At this point, because the patient was under general, general anesthetic, the piercing was not removed and it was just covered with gauze and tape because the patient was being positioned on a prone, prone position on gel rules for surgery. So as we can see, we could go on and on with some of the examples uh, that, uh, the identified examples that we reviewed, but here are some very interesting examples and as you can see, it could happen just because of handoff communication was not adequate. After reviewing the data, one of the things that uh, for my, my MSM project that I needed to do was I needed to turn to peer review evidence-based literature to support what the data was saying. We already seen in, in, in the previous slides of this presentation that it did support the handoff communication uh, was the majority of the events that happened with the surgical patient. But here's additional evidence-based literature and what it really says is that handoff communication between the operating room and post-anesthesia care units is imperative for the continuum of care. Also indicates that using an evidence-based handoff checklist or communication tool can help decrease adverse safety events when the patient transitions from the operating room to the PACU or other departments in the healthcare facility. And why is that important? Being a nurse and, and getting, hand, getting handoff communication from the operating room, it is very difficult and it's time consuming, uh, but possibly even just having a checklist saying, I covered all of this pertinent information uh, and this is what my next healthcare provider needs to know about my patient. And then the standardization of evidence-based communication tool is a critical part of handoff communication. There was a study that was completed and by uh, Lord and Sack et al. And the study was regarding a handoff communication issues in an organization that completes over 8,000 elective and emergent surgeries every year. And what they wanted to know was they wanted to know when the staff used a standardized handoff communication tool effectively and efficiently each time, what was the result? So 91% of the staff reported that the use of standardized communication tools increased their perception that safer, better care occurred. Additionally, by using a standardized communication tool, the perception of staff was that they delivered better care that led to improved, safe, quality patient care. And we can see by the studies that was, committed, that, uh, was completed earlier in the slides that that is, that is true. How do we communicate effectively and efficiently? Standardized handoff communication during the coordination and care of the surgical patient can happen by using an evidence-based communication tool. Standardizing the use of an evidence-based communication tool, such as using an SBAR or using uh, the IPASS, can really help with handoff communication and decrease patient safety events while giving a concise, focused review of the patient's condition to help ease the coordination of care from one healthcare provider to another. The SBAR tool is regarded as the best practice for patient safety when it comes to coordination of patient care. We, you can see the SBAR tool stands for Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. In a quasi-experiment conducted by Samara and Fathi, the use of the SBAR tool to teach effective handoff communication, decrease patient safety events, and standardize the care of the patient, which helped improve critical data points in the patient's care to pass from one healthcare provider to another. As you can see here, the figure is of a SBAR tool. IPASS is the second most commonly used. IPASS most is uh, what we have found is used mostly uh, by physicians, um, but sometimes by nursing also. And the reason why I bring it up here is because IPASS is, like I said, another one of those standardized evidence-based communication tools that helps decrease patient safety events. IPASS stands for illness, illness severity, patient summary, action list, situation awareness, contingency background synthesis by received, also known 
um, at the IPASS tool. The patient summary would include a statement of the patient's condition events that led up to the patient's admission through the hospital course, ongoing assessment, and plan for moving forward. The action list is to do for the patient and who is responsible for what to do. So the action list is what do I need to do next? Uh, you know, the patient needs to have oxygen, it can have, the patient can have morphine every two hours for pain, so forth and so on. The situation awareness and contingency plan is knowing what is going on with the patient and having a plan for what might happen during the patient's course of treatment. And synthesis by the receiver is where the receiver summarizes what was heard a time to ask questions and restate key actions or to-do lists. So you ask, how do I have time? I'm, I'm dropping, I'm giving a handoff communication to pack you. How do I have time to do all of this handoff? Well, like we said before, it would be easy if you used an evidence-based checklist also. If you would have a checklist that would go down, and it could be in the electronic medical record, where you have a checklist and you go down and your handoff communication is very concise and to the point, and covers all of these bases either in the SBAR or in the IPASS communication tools. So how can you help? You wanna review your current communication processes within your own organization. If your organization is not currently using an evidence-based communication tool, recommend implementing one. Standardize the way handoff communication is completed by consistently using an evidence-based communication tool to its fullest potential. And like we said before, the SBAR and IPASS tools have become best practices when coordinating the care of the patient in any area, but especially in the surgical area, when a patient is transitioned from one care provider to another. So what are your next steps? Don't let your loved one become the next safety event. If we have that in the back of our mind, we will always do the right thing no matter how rushed we are. And it's not that we don't ever wanna do the right thing. Sometimes we develop workarounds that uh, allow us to not complete or utilize those evidence-based communication tools effectively and efficiently as they've been designed. So what you wanna do is work on a cohesive team together to decrease communication issues at pivotal points during care coordination with a surgical patient. Share what you learned here today and spread the news to help decrease safety events that happen during the coordination of care of the surgical patient, to help increase safe quality patient care to enhance better outcomes. Always remember your plan, do, study, act. If we plan for what we wanna do next, we look at what we're gonna do, we check and then we act, and then always use that plan, do, study, act. This is a nice toolkit for links for evidence-based communication tools. You can click on these, you'll be able to find samples of the iPass, you'll be able to find uh, what you can do to implement that process of implementing the iPass or the SBAR, how you can get buy-in from staff, and how you can move forward and evaluate the results of your uh, new practice for implementing evidence-based communication tools and using them during each care coordination touch point for the surgical patient. Thanks, Penny. That concludes the slide presentation portion of our program. Now we would like to begin our question and answer period. Penny, it looks like we have um, a few questions. Uh, can the evidence-based communication tools convert to an electronic medical record? Kelly, that is a great question, and yes. Uh, I personally have seen both paper and electronic medical record um, evidence-based communication tools that can work uh, both efficient, effectively and efficiently. You can work with your health information informatics team. I'm sure that there's probably already one built. If not, you, it would be a, a, a process that you can work with them for. Thank you for the question. Sure. How did you and the the Patient Safety Authority pull the data from PA PACERS? Boy, Kelly, that is another great question. Um, certainly when we, uh, Regina and uh, the data analysis met, we uh, looked at reviewing uh, the safety events that reported through the, the Patient Safety Authority's uh, reporting system. We specifically looked at surgical patients 
because um, we wanted to take a look at um, first the key area types. Um, so obviously it was the surgical patients. We wanted to take a look at you know how far back were we going to go with the data, and we looked at the year. We actually went back just this past year, and it resulted in a lot of uh, safety events. Then we went to the event types, and um, as you've seen by the communication, and we used the key words as communication, handoff, and time off. Great question, thank you. Have you seen in your travels and working with other facilities uh, um, a tool that is utilized more frequently? Yes, and thank you, Kelly, and, and who asked that question. It's a great, a great question. The SBAR is, is used the most, is the tool that I see used the most. It is either electronic and or paper, uh, but that is the tool that I've used most. Some actually use it as a, they actually write out on the SBAR. Some uses it as a checkbox that they can pull pertinent information from the patient's medical record that's actually on the SBAR tool. They can print that off and use that um, or pull up a computer and use that as handoff to guide the communication. It's amazing how we can integrate the technology into the communication that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you for that answer. Sure. Another, another question came in, are examples of handoff tools available that can be used as a starting point for organizations to build their own? Yes, there are. And like we had shown you, I'm going to go back up to uh, slide 25. There are examples of handoff communication tools on, um, I'm so, so sorry, on the IHI website, on AHRQ's website. Uh, so there are links here so that you can see samples of ex uh, communication tools. Perfect, thank you. Um, and I will just plug for team steps. Um, certainly uh, we have individuals in our organization who train and can give you more information. So. Either contact your patient safety liaison for your facility. If you're unfamiliar with who that individual is, you can call our main office. Kenny, thank you so much for um, all this information. It's definitely great to see what the data, you're sharing your personal experience um, and how that can translate into practice in facilities. Um, I don't see any additional questions at this time. Uh, Penny, do you have anything else you would like to comment on before we close and wrap up? Yeah, Kelly, I do. I mean, that is a great point, too. Team Steps is a wonderful, they have a lot of different tools that you can use and a lot of different keywords that if you do see that there is a safety event that may be happening um, not only in handoff communication or the coordination of care of the surgical patient, but just in any of the care, there's certain keywords that you can use that would basically have like a time out and say, you know, let's just stop at this time, let's reassess the situation, and let's move forward prior to a safety event happening. Um, and, you know, we can prevent those near misses that, that we see happen, and that's what we want, right? We want to start reporting all of those near misses so that we don't have those sentinel events. So we have a couple questions here. Um, root cause per joint commission, are researchers exploring more additional drill downs into the types of communication failures? May I ask for a restate of that question, or let me see if I can understand what you're asking. Are we asking if joint commission is uh, re requiring additional information or sub-event types for root cause analysis? The, the language, what is written in here is since communication is still the number one root cause per joint commission, are researchers exploring drill downs into the types of communication failures? Yes, um, and that's what we've seen here, and that's what definitely the Patient Safety Authority is doing also. Uh, we looked at the sub-event types, but there is also uh, other event sub-event types if you drill down further. So there is the ability, especially when you're doing your root cause analysis, to drill down and ask those five whys. You always want to ask why, 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 why until you actually get to the root cause. If you don't ever get to the root cause of an, an event, the event will continue to reoccur. I hope that helps. And if well, that's an answer, 
questions, so certainly if we can get more um, additional comment, comments, we can certainly address that. And while this presentation wasn't on root cause analysis per se, um, there is a lot of data out there, you know, uh, on how to perform a root cause analysis um, outside of the scope of this presentation. And it looks like that in, that individual said that that was a perfect that was answered what they were getting at. So thank you. Sure. Um, it looks like um, the reference for the Kirschbaum for the Kirschbaum reference on slide 13. Somebody would like additional. Um, I guess it was not on the reference list. If we can just get the full citation there, is that yes. possible? The references are listed in the. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I don't think we got there because we were doing the, uh, here, there's three pages of references, so you will find the full reference on these slides here. Does that help? Thank you. You're welcome. I know we had the, edu I think we have the educational uh, information prior to the references. And certainly if there's any other questions that you may think of, Certainly you can reach out to the authority and I would be more than happy to answer those questions as you think of them. Somebody else had commented that a great presentation, but they also had done their handoff for their capstone and it was about the iPass. And iPass website has many free products to help staff. So if anybody else is you know, curious where to go or look for additional information. So I appreciate the individual who shared that information. Yes, and thank you, too. I, I appreciate that, too. I know that there are some, in the toolkit, there's some links for the iPass also, um, but certainly, you know, for your capstone, you might have done, uh, might have different references that would be helpful, too. Thank you for that. If there are additional questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A panel. Um, it's a lot of good food for thought, I think. Um, if there are individuals who are going back to their facilities, Penny, do you have any um, what would be the number one thing to maybe tackle in going back and tr wanting to do something about handoff communication? So a great question. First thing I would look at is what do you currently do? Uh, you know, and, and what's currently expected of the facility? You know, if, you're, if your policy is saying that you're supposed to be using an evidence-based handoff communication during handoff, then that's the expectation. Leadership has set that expectation and that's what they would want to see. You know, uh, so first look to see, are you using an evidence-based communication tool? If you are not using ev an evidence-based communication tool, work with your, uh, you know, you can start, if you have a nurse practice council, you can start working with a nurse practice council to do it, or you can just start doing it in your own department as a pilot. Pick a tool that you uh, think would work great in the surgical arena, such as the SBAR or the iPad. Um, there's certainly, there's many other evidence-based tools out there, but the most, uh, uh, most cited is the iPass and the YesBar tools, and then implement that, pilot it, and then you can expand it throughout your organization from there. You might also want to take a look, where is your organization with safety events? Do you have a lot of safety events that happen during handoff when you're handing from one care provider to another, hence the coordination of care of the patient? Um, and as we said earlier, it's not just during the surgical arena, you know, you got to think about what about those same day surgery patients when they go home? How's that handoff communication happening to the next provider or the family or the caregivers? And are there events that happen? Are you having readmissions because handoff didn't happen well for those same day surgery patients and now they're coming back into the emergency room later? So that is what I would do. One, take a look at what, you know, what is expected of your organization as determined by leadership. Two, are you actually using a, a evidence-based communication tool? If not, then certainly implement one. And then, you know, do you, do you have a, a, a problem that you can certainly back and build your case uh, to help leadership back you using an, an, an evidence-based communication tool? Great information, and, and just trying to make sure I, I touch on the questions that are coming through, and I think to some degree you've really answered this already. Um, we have a question asking, can you describe how you identify and mitigate the risk of safety events in the surgical area? And I, I, I think you kind of touched on that with this last question. Yes, and, and that is what you want to do. Uh, first, you know, how, how do you identify or mitigate those risks? One, you have to know, do you have a risk? 
Now, are you getting any reports back, uh, maybe from your performance improvement department or your patient safety department or your manager of surgical services of the events that actually are happening in your surgical care area? Uh, if you're not, I would, I would start there saying, you know, what are my events? What, what can I do to help increase patient safety to decrease safety events within the surgical area? And then and, and go from there. You can't, you can't prevent something if you're not sure that things are happening, or you can't, if you think something's gonna happen, you need to stop the line. Using such, like we talked about previously about team steps, how they have those key words. If you see something happening, um, you're gonna go transfer a patient and you stay on three and someone moves on two, you know, that is a lack of communication and the patient falls on the floor. So you really need to be clear of all of those safety events that happen within your organization, such as the examples we've seen. You know, you really wanna make sure that if, if you had a patient who came in who was supposed to be on droplet isolation and no one communicated that to you, that's a safety event. You need to mitigate that and make sure that that doesn't happen again. I hope that helped. Did that, did that answer the question for them, Kelly? I think so, thank you so much. Because there's a lot of things to take into consideration when you're going to implement or where to tackle and focus your efforts. Um, you, you talked about the nursing practice councils. What role um, have you seen the nursing practice councils play in implementation of these communication tools? Very interesting question, the, and, and a great question. You know, nursing practice council, uh, I'm not sure who's a magnet hospital and who's not. Um, usually they're developed because of, you know, they want to be a magnet hospital or, or try to get to be a high reliable organization with zero harm. So, you know, I have seen leadership give nursing practice councils the leeway to say, yes, if you want to implement an evidence-based communication tool to decrease safety events or prevent safety events that are happening within our organization, I, I I would not think that your leadership would say no. <laughs> um, but yes, the nurse practice councils, they do lead the way and then they report up to leadership. They do have the autonomy, I guess that is what I'm getting at. I hope that answered the question. Yes, and very, a lot of food for thought. Um, I think there's been a lot of questions that have come in that we've answered um, and a lot of to, I think, wrap our brains around as far as probably next steps of, as far as implementation. Um, if there's any other questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A. Um, again, it, it, just gr some great information, a lot of food for thought. Um, and do you have any, um, comments or thoughts, and in, in especially recently with what we've been seeing with COVID, any um, communication concerns, certainly particular to that, anything that you explored in the data when you were looking at that? Again, great question. And COVID is so new. To have a, to find evidence-based peer-reviewed literature regarding COVID, it's just so new yet. Uh, you know, I mean, while I have seen articles, um, I, have there one article here or there, and they were not scholarly articles that I would be able to uh, recite at this time. Well, this has been a great topic. I know handoff has been something I think a lot of organizations have tackled for quite a few years now. Um, I, there's no golden nugget for it, so I think it, it's a great topic that we need to continue discussing. Um, I really appreciate, Penny, any other final thoughts before we close? I, I, again, I just want to thank everyone for taking time out of their busy day. I know it's a, a Friday afternoon and we greatly appreciate you attending. I want to thank uh, the Patient Safety Authority for allowing me to uh, utilize them as my practicum site. I think it's been a wonderful experience and um, Regina has been, and the authority has been great. So thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Penny. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today for this presentation. Thank you. This concludes our webinar.